Hey friends, welcome back to the journal feed. My name is Nick Zelt, and this is the only place to get spoon-fed the latest and greatest of emergency medicine. We are trying to keep you up on the literature, and we're trying to make that easy for you by spoon-feeding it to you. Now, let's take a quick look at everything that we'll be spoon-feeding this week. First off, never, ever, never, never forget sedation. Paralysis is a nightmare that no one wants coming true. Second, a better test for finding that septic joint. Third, conjunctivitis, is that a virus or do they need antibiotics? Fourth, video games are for adults, also VR in the emergency department. And then finally, the last article, POCUS, for your pulse checks. Why palpate when you can probe? Now, if you're hearing this right now, then you are not currently a Journal Feed subscriber. Why not? So you're not going to be receiving the full Journal Feed podcast, only a portion of the past week's articles. Don't worry, though, I pick my favorites, but if you'd like to get full access to both the podcast and the blog, then you will have to become a member. All the details for that are at journalfeed.org. Now, we don't want money to ever be a barrier to patient care, though, so if you're having any trouble affording a subscription, please reach out and we can help. This is the audio version of the past week summaries, which this week were brought to you by Jonathan Brewer, Vivian Lay, Megan Hilbert, myself, and Clay Smith. And here's the first article. Awareness with Paralysis Among Critically Ill Emergency Department Patients, a prospective cohort study out of the Journal of Critical Care Medicine. A nightmare that I'm sure people literally have is to be completely paralyzed. Now, I don't know about you, but I've spoken with people who have things like sleep paralysis, and they find it very unpleasant. And that's in the safety of your own bed. Forget being in a strange place like a hospital with a tube down your throat. It's no surprise that these people end up with PTSD quite frequently. It's our job as the people who are kind of in charge of the medications to ensure that this doesn't happen. Something we already know does actually happen, though, because of the ED awareness study, which demonstrated that this happens as much as 2.6% of the time. That was just a one-site study, though. How about this bigger, multi-center cohort study? This was a secondary analysis of the ED SED pilot trial, a multi-center prospective before and after trial that included 388 ventilated patients who got neuromuscular blockades. Awake with paralysis was the primary outcome, as assessed by questionnaire, and perceived threat was the secondary outcome. They chose this as the secondary outcome because it's in the causal pathway for PTSD. Here, 13 patients, that is 3.4%, had awareness with paralysis. All but one of them got rocaronium. There was also a much higher likelihood that they had a perceived threat, which was associated with this awareness with paralysis. Now, I don't think that the takeaway from this that rock is bad. I think we should take away from this that post-intubation sedation should be proceduralized and just automatic. You should not order induction medications without following up with sedation orders. Don't complicate your resuscitation, of course, but try to order them both at the same time. While you're intubating, someone should probably be preparing sedation medication. In a spoonful, this is further evidence that we are not doing a good job of sedating our patients post-intubation. We can and we must do better. Okay, then we jump all the way to the fifth article. Titled, Point of Care Ultrasound Compression of the Carotid Artery for Pulse Determination in Cardiopulmonary Resuscitation out of the Journal of Resuscitation. If you tell me that you're really good at palpating a pulse during CPR, well, you're maybe the kind of person who comes to the emergency department and tells the doctor that they have a high pain tolerance. Just admit that it's imprecise and it's hard to do. The experts at all things pulses, that is vascular surgeons, they use Dopplers. So we should be able to use POCUS. Some past evidence has shown that it's kind of slow, but it certainly doesn't have to be. I don't see why it needs to be. Here's a method that might be quicker. This was a single-center prospective study with a sample size of 25 patients, including both in and out of hospital cardiac arrests undergoing CPR in the emergency department. After compressions were started, they put a linear probe over the middle of the neck to find the internal jugular and carotid artery. They then slowly applied compression, and if the carotid artery was completely compressible or there's no pulsitivity, then they were considered pulseless. Carotid ultrasound was previously shown to be 90% sensitive and specific at detecting the presence or absence of a pulse. The primary outcome was time to pulse determination, comparing POCUS at the carotid artery compared to manual palpation at the femoral artery. Focus was faster by 2 seconds at 1.6 seconds to get that pulse determination. 
They also showed that these pocus pulse checks never exceeded 10 seconds, and time to ROSC determination was reduced by more than half compared with manual palpation. I have some beef with this though, forgetting the fact that I might not care about two seconds worth of being faster, and that you should never prolong your rhythm checks just for feeling for a pulse anyways, recall that ACLS actually just calls for rhythm checks every two minutes and not pulse checks. We were not comparing apples to apples here though. The person doing the pocus did just the pocus and that was it. Point fini. The person doing manual palpation had to check the pulse and decide whether or not they had achieved ROSC by also assessing the rhythm. That's cognitive load and that's gonna slow you down. So I can't call pocus faster based on this. Not to mention that the femoral pulse is just not going to be as good as the carotid pulse. In a spoonful, if you're looking for a pulse in a CPR patient, then POCUS seems to be faster, but not by much and not even on a level playing field. All right, let's wrap up everything that we talked about. What did we learn today? From the first article, patients being paralyzed without sedation is terrible. I was shocked by the ED awareness study, which showed a prevalence of 2.6%, and now we have an even higher one at 3.4%. I hope with this information, the next study will show 0%. And then from the last article, the probe again proves more mighty than the hand. Focus for pulse checks was faster than manual palpation. Links to all the articles summarized can be found at journalfeed.org, where the newsletter is going to be the best place to make the podcast into a bite-sized nugget of space repetition. If you're feeling like you're missing out a little bit, you'd like to hear more podcasts, or you'd like to have the blog, then join us in the members feed. Our goal here is to provide better patient care through spoon feeding, and so we're trying to help you keep up with the latest research, one spoonful at a time.